In this video, I'll talk about using linear algebra to analyze engineering systems. Engineering analysis often consists of defining unknowns and then determining the equations necessary to solve for those unknowns. If the equations are linear, the techniques in this video can provide a valuable approach towards solving the equations describing the system. First, I'll talk about a typical approach used to analyze engineering systems. Usually, the first step is to define the unknowns in the system. After defining variables, you'll want to write as many equations as you have unknowns. If these equations are independent, then they'll have what is called a unique solution, which means that there is only one solution. Once you have equations describing the system, you can solve the equations to determine values for the unknowns. If you've done your job correctly, solving for the unknowns in the governing equation will provide the information necessary to solve your original engineering problem. All of the above is independent of the type of equations you're writing and how you solve them. However, if the equations are linear, you can analyze the system using techniques presented in this chapter. I'll talk about nonlinear systems later. For the moment, assume that all the equations we will be working with are linear. Linear systems of equations can be placed in matrix form. If we have the same number of equations as unknowns, the matrix form of the equations is a square matrix A times a vector of unknowns, X, is equal to a vector B. If the system of equations has n unknowns and n equations, A will be an n by n matrix of numbers. X will be a column vector with n rows. It contains a list of the unknowns that we need to determine values for. B is also a column vector with n rows containing numbers. Let's do an example to see how it works. In this example, I have a beam that's supported with a hinge on one end and a roller here. I'm applying a 100 Newton force straight down at this end of the beam. The first thing I need to do is define the unknowns and write the equations governing the system. This hinge can support forces in two directions. It will keep this end from moving either vertically or horizontally, but it won't keep the end from rotating. It's like a hinge on a door. You can rotate the door, but you can't move the door up down or sideways. I'll call this end point A and I'll define two unknown forces in two directions. FAX will be the horizontal force and FAY will be the vertical force at point A. The roller will support a vertical force but not a horizontal force. This is similar to riding a skateboard. It'll hold you up but it won't keep you from moving sideways. I'll call this point B and I'll define a vertical force, FBY, at this point. The system has three unknowns, so next I need to write three equations to solve for those unknowns. Now I can write the equations governing the system. I do that with what's called a free body diagram, which shows all the forces on the beam. Since the beam won't move in any direction, the sum of the forces in any direction has to be zero. Newton's law tells us that the sum of the forces on a body is its mass times acceleration. So if the body is stationary, acceleration is zero and the sum of the forces is equal to zero. Since the body also can't rotate, the sum of the moments at any point is also zero. Moments are simply forces that cause rotation, like when you twist a jar lid to open it. So if I sum forces in the x or horizontal direction, the only force in that direction is FAx, so it sums to zero. Sum of the forces in the vertical direction is FAy. I'm going to treat upward forces as being positive, so plus FBy. The 100 Newton force is downed, so that gets a negative 100. Those also sum to zero. Now I'm going to sum moments around this point. Moments are a force times a moment arm. The contributions from these two forces are zero. This FBY provides a moment which is FBY times its moment arm, which is five meters. I'll claim that that's a positive contribution. The 100 Newton force causes a moment in the opposite direction, so that's negative. 
100 newtons times its moment arm, which is 8 meters, sums to zero. Now I've got the equations. Next, I'll put them in matrix form and solve them. Now that we've got the unknowns defined and the equations written, we can place them in a matrix. These are the equations governing the system. We want to use linear algebra techniques to solve the equations and find numerical values for the unknowns. This means that we need to write the equations in matrix form. Since there are three equations and three unknowns, this will be of the form of a 3 by 3 matrix A times a three element column vector X containing the list of unknowns is equal to a three element column vector B. The first thing I need to do is decide what order I want my variables to be in the X vector. I'm going to choose them to be in the order FAX, FAY, and FBY. This order doesn't really matter, but I need to decide what it is so that I know how to load the A and the B matrices. The first equation here is 1 times FAX is equal to 0. FAY and FBY don't show up in this equation. I can get rid of them by multiplying them by 0. So this is 1 times FAX plus 0 times FAY plus 0 times FBY is equal to 0. The second equation is 1 times FAY plus 1 times FBY is equal to 100. When I move this to the other side of the equation, it changes its sign. There's no FAX in this equation. I can handle that by multiplying this by a 0. The last equation is 5 times FBY is equal to 800, moving this to the other side. There's no FAX and there's no FAY. So this is the matrix form of our equations. Next, I'll talk about solving the system of equations. First, I'll create the A and B matrices. A equals 1, 0, 0, semicolon, 0, 1, 1, semicolon, 0, 0, 5, and B equals 0, semicolon, 100, semicolon, 800. To solve for the unknowns, set X equals a backslash b. The result is x equals 0, negative 60, and 160. The first element of x is fax, so fax is equal to 0. fay is the second element in the vector, so fay is negative 60. Finally, fby is positive 160. Keep in mind that Octave doesn't know which element in the vector corresponds to which unknown. We need to keep track of that ourselves. Checking results is important, and it's easy to do in this case. The first equation is just FAX equals zero, which agrees with Octave's result from solving the equations. Similarly, the third equation was five times FBY equals 800. This means that FBY is 800 over 5, which is 160, which also agrees with the result Octave gave us. Finally, the second equation is FAY plus FBY is equal to 100. If we substitute FBY equals 160 into this, that means that FAY has to be negative 60, which is exactly the result Octave gave us. It's unlikely that most of the problems we use Octave 4 will be as easy to solve by hand as this one, but it's always important to at least look at the Octave results to make sure that they make sense in terms of the original equations. So far, we've learned a little bit about linear algebra, and we can use Octave to solve linear systems of equations. From a practical standpoint, this is probably all we really need to know, but there is one important topic I haven't really touched on how a matrix inverse is calculated. Calculating the inverse of a matrix using octave seems easy, but it actually requires a lot of unnecessary calculations and it's prone to round off errors. There are much more efficient and accurate approaches to solving systems of equations. The next video will give us some more detail on that topic.